want to welcome you to Bible Optics. We're in class number 13 in our series, The Armor of God. Again, for those of you maybe that are joining us this morning, would you take a, the opportunity to just let us know that you are there, that you're watching. Um, if you've got any comments about the series or uh, this particular session this morning, as we go through the session or at the end, if you'd like to post a comment, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions about this series, um, please feel free to post those questions as well. And I will endeavor through the remainder of the series to uh, answer that question for you as best I can, if I have, if I have an answer, that is. Um, let me also, uh, might I, at the onset of this morning, uh, let you know that um, as of next week, I will be um, back in the phase center here in Alpharetta in Georgia. So if you're in the area um, and get the opportunity, I, I would just ask that maybe you would consider coming and joining us uh, at our Tuesday morning service or at our Thursday evening service or at our Saturday morning service this time next week in Alpharetta here uh, at the Phase Centre. Um, we'd love to see you. It's a different environment altogether. I mean, it's one thing me just speaking to a camera. But when we get into that environment, we, we get to be able to ask questions and, and endeavor to answer questions. So, I mean, as stuff comes up in your head, we get to talk about it. Um, sometimes our series ends up a lot longer because we are answering and asking questions throughout. Um, and so it, it sort of it peters out a little bit longer. Whereas here, I sort of decide what we're going to talk about today and I try to fill it all in within the hour. So please come and, come in and experience that environment um, in the Faith Centre here in Alpharetta in Georgia. We would love to see you. And if I haven't maybe met you before, maybe you've just sort of joined us through this uh, COVID experience where we have been uh, uh, you know, shelter in place a scenario and maybe you had the opportunity to click on and, and find us or maybe somebody encouraged you to, to come and, and join us or watch us. Maybe you'd consider um, just coming down to meet with us. Come down to see us uh, and join us at the Faith Centre here in Alpharetta. Anyway, I would so love to see you. Um, and uh, again, as I said, it's a completely different environment than this. So, we're in the armour of God and we're in uh, class number 13 in this particular series. Now, I won't recap, so much to recap, but I do encourage you to go back and look at it. Take it all in its context uh, and understand the parallel worlds that, that exist and uh, how that this spirit world affects the human affairs and that if we want to affect human affairs, then we likewise have got to engage uh, that arena and we are... Uh, and have been given a special adornment uh, to uh, successfully engage that arena. And this adornment is called the armor of God. Let me say this too at the onset. God doesn't need armor, okay? God's not afraid of anybody. Uh, God's not fearful of anyone. Uh, God is not having to defend himself. The armor of God is not armor for God. It's not armor that God has. It's armor that God gives to man. Jesus, as a man was the test pilot of it. Jesus as a man came and proved it and then he gave it to us and uh, he gave it to us for the same reason to be able to engage the spiritual forces that affect human affairs by engaging them in the spiritual arena and that's what this particular armor is for. So let's read it. The armor of God here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. We'll read through this. Finally, my brethren, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, not part, but the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the systematic methodical attacks, the ABCs, the processes of, of, of the enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And again, Paul, by the Spirit of God, has drawn our attention to the fact that our conflict is not in, in the people that we see around us. It's the influence uh, that they're under. It's that engagement. And that, that influence is principalities against the powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we engage. And this is what this armor is for. It's to empower and enable us 
to engage them in that arena uh, with all the force and the ability to enforce their defeat and thus change the effect on the affairs of men. So, wherefore, or because of these entities, take on to you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, continue to stand. Keep your guard up. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that's what we're going to take on this morning. And above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There are seven parts to this armor, and again, Jesus and was, so to speak, the test pilot for the armor of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 that he dressed himself in this attire and came down and engaged the enemy, engaged those entities on that level. God, Jesus did not come down to sort out the Roman Empire. He didn't come down to sort out the enemies of Israel in the physical. The Bible says God loved the world. God loved Caesar. God loved people. But he came after the entities, the influence in that spiritual arena that was having effect on the affairs of men. And that's what Jesus came to do. And having done that, now he gave that armor to us. Seven parts to it. There is a stand there for having your loins geared about with truth. We said truth was to unveil reality. And we talked about how that Jesus unveiled the Father. Nobody had ever seen him. Nobody had been... a. a uh, physically, tangibly, uh, had the ability to, to encounter God. But Jesus came and he became God in flesh. He became the, the outworking, the outliving of the physical reality that God is. And so his life became an unveiling of something that man had not experienced, but he came to reveal it. Likewise, we become, and we make the part of our armor is to, uh, uh, right from the get-go, we make a decision that we are going to live a life that unveils the reality that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he is risen and seated at the right hand of the Father. Most people cannot, have not, and did not experience that or see that tangibly in their five senses. However, it has changed my life and your life, and it's true. And, and, and we now use our life to unveil and to reveal that reality that Jesus is risen. And, and, um, uh, and then having on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, again, is this awareness that we are uh, in right standing with God, right relationship with God, and that relationship affords us uh, a certain certain rights and privileges that other people wouldn't have, and we not just have them, but we got to walk in them. It's a it, it's a it's a put your head up and your shoulders back and have confidence that I, I, I'm in God, God's in me, and it, it's just a relational awareness. It's it's a it's a righteous awareness it's a righteous consciousness i'm accepted in in the beloved i have access to the throne of god i have access to my heavenly father i'm in a right relationship with him and and if i'm in right relationship with him and if god be for me who can be against me truly so we're going to talk this morning here about your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace now let me go here. We talked here about the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Then later on, Paul, referring to the armor of light, says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we started to talk about how we're literally putting on an individual. We're putting on the, the personality of Jesus. We step into his nature, his character, his quality, his substance, his authority, his rank, and his power. And we brought this up. He is truth. He is righteousness. He is our peace. He is the author and finisher of faith. He is the salvation. He is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. And he is the intercessor that ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's all of these things. He's all of the armor of God. We're putting on a person. And it's what makes us indestructible when we get into the spiritual arena because Jesus already made a show of these entities openly and he destroyed their leader and he destroyed all of their power. And so we step into that arena 
and we enforce that defeat, but we dress ourselves accordingly to do so. We talked about truth unveiling reality. Dress yourself with the decision that your life now lived will reveal the fact that Jesus Christ is risen, is alive and lives through me. And again, putting on the armor is sequential. You've got to put this on first. This has got to be your first decision. My life, dress yourself with the decision that your life now lived will reveal the fact that Jesus Christ is risen, is alive and lives through me. Or I put down here at the bottom, when you see and hear and watch me, you are witnessing him. That's exactly what he did with the Father. Jesus said the same, Philip said, show us the Father. And he says, Philip, when you see me, you see him. Somebody says, show me Jesus. Well, when you see me, you see him. When you hear me, you hear him. When you watch my, my, my reaction or my response in life, you're watching him respond to life. And this is a decision we have to make. And it's part of the armor of God. And it's an essential one because it is the primary uh, truth that we need, to, we need to put on. This is what we're going to do. And then we talked about righteous and righteous consciousness. The ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. We've got to understand that through Jesus Christ we've been made righteous. And I talked a few times and give several illustrations about just that relational connect um, and how that man under sin always had that barrier, that boundary, that awareness, that standoffishness with God because he was aware of his own inadequacy. He was aware of his own guilt. He was aware of his own sin. He was sin conscious. And that although God gives them an at one minute process, they, they, it didn't fix them. But the blood of Jesus fixed us. And that blood of Jesus didn't just deal with our sin in the sense that we were being, it was, it, he redeemed us and paid the price for our sin, past, present, and future, but he restored us into right relationship. And we've got to understand that. We've got to be righteous conscious instead of sin conscious. We've got to get our identity now, not in Adam and the fall of Adam and, and sin consciousness, but we get our identity in Christ Jesus and his uh, victory in his resurrection and his uh, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father in which we are seated there also. And we have a righteous uh, uh, relationship with God. We have that ability to come into the presence of God without this sense of inferiority or guilt. Or I put down here, righteousness is not a position or a location. Righteousness is a relationship. So as we step out into this arena with the armor of God, we are consciously aware, we've consciously decided that our life is going to personify everything that Jesus is. And secondly, we're going to put our head back and our, our head up and our shoulders back and our chest out, so to speak, and we're going to realize I have right standing with God. I have a relationship with the living and the almighty God. And that has and affords us privileges and rights that other people don't have. And we've got to walk in them. We've got to be confident in them. And so we've got to be righteous, conscious. If you're sin conscious, you'll never do this. You'll never, you'll be beaten as soon as you get out there. So, let me explain the difference with peace. We're going to talk about the, 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 our, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let me explain this. Peace with God and the peace of God. A redemption gives us peace with God. Righteousness gives us the peace of God. Let me say that again. Redemption. When Jesus paid the price for our sin, when Jesus uh, uh, shed his blood uh, uh, on behalf of all of my, my uh, sins, he paid the price. He paid the penalty for what I've done. Past, present, and future. He paid that. He redeemed me, bought me back from the slave market, and he put me in right relationship. Or not right relationship. He, he, he gave me peace with God. The war with God is over. The enmity with God is over. He paid the price. And I now had peace with God. When I got the peace with God because of redemption, I became righteous. And now righteousness gave me the peace of God. So you got to understand, one is the peace with God, which came through the new birth. And then the other one is the peace of God, which comes through 
my righteousness relationship with God. So, let me explain it here in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous. This is all, this all happened at the new birth experience. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of being reconciled. We have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation. We have the peace of reconciliation. That's the peace of the new bear. We've been reconciled. We have the peace of reconciliation and to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is peace with God, which then gives us the peace of God. But we have to have this peace with God first. So this peace with God is us being justified, acquitted, declared righteous. That's Jesus paying the price. I now have peace with God, but the peace with God gives me the peace of God. The peace with God gives me the peace of God. Now, these two are married together. When, when you've been given the peace uh, with God, which is... A, a justification and, a, and acquittal and righteousness. When, when righteousness shows up, the outworking of righteousness is peace. It's not peace with God, it's now the peace of God. Once you get the peace with God, you now have peace of God. Okay? So let me, let me show. Peace with God is righteousness. Peace with God is justification, acquittal. Peace with God produces the peace of God, which is confidence and courage and assurance and calm. I don't have to struggle anymore. I don't have to worry anymore. I don't have to be afraid anymore. I don't have to panic anymore. I don't have to feel deserted anymore. I don't have to feel unworthy anymore. I don't have to feel disconnected, disjointed. It's all sorted. Jesus sorted it all out. Jesus made me righteous, but that righteousness awareness, that righteous consciousness gives me the peace of God. Peace with God gives me the peace of God. This is why I'm saying when you're putting on the armor of God, you can't put on bits and pieces of it. If you're sin conscious, you'll never have the peace of God. Even though you've been made righteous, you won't have the peace of God because you'll still be sin conscious. Still always aware of your failings and, and, and faults and whatever, and you'll never be able to have the peace of God, and you'll never be able to engage these entities entities because you won't have confidence, courage, assurance, and calm. You'll be afraid of your life, you'll panic, you'll worry. What if, what if, what if? So you've got to put this on. You're, you're dressing yourself in the armor of God. You put on truth, then you put on righteousness. And righteousness produces, peace with God, righteousness produces the peace of God. And that's what we're talking about this morning, the peace of God. So, peace with God, righteousness, produces the peace of God. And that peace of God is this confidence, this courage, this assurance, this calm that we have and, and, and when we know we're in right standing with God. Where righteousness is realized, peace is manifest. Where righteousness is realized, very important. If you don't realize righteousness, if you still see yourself as a, 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 you know, a beggarly, poor sinner, waiting to you know be extracted from the planet or meet Jesus in the great by and by in the sky and, and you and you live this weak and beggarly life on the planet you'll never be able to engage the principalities powers and so on and so forth 
you, you may do somewhat in your own personal life for yourself, as I said, in minor league, but you certainly will not be able to engage them in the major league. Just It'll never happen. Because you've got to have this awareness of righteousness. You've got to have this confidence in this ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. You've got to have that first. Because where righteousness is realized, then the peace of God is manifested. Peace with God, righteousness, when it's realized, manifests the peace of God, which is that courage and assurance and that confidence and calm. So, biblical peace, and this is what we're talking about, biblical peace is generated from a conscious awareness of a righteous relationship what Almighty God. Uh, and biblical peace is, it, it, it's generated when I realize I'm right with God. When I realize that there's nothing between God and I. When I realize that I have access to Him. When I realize that I'm the I'm, I'm, I'm the focus of His attention. When I realize that, that I that I am loved and I'm accepted and 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 I have privileges that that I didn't have before but now that I'm a son and an heir and a co-heir with Christ Jesus I, I have I, I have privileges I have rights and I didn't earn them and I didn't deserve them but but I'm there nonetheless and this biblical peace this looking at life through this optic of absolute confidence and courage and awareness and calm that 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 I'm, I'm, I'm righteous brings and generates this this peace. Biblical peace is generated from a conscious awareness of a righteous relationship with Almighty God. Now I chose my words here. It's a conscious awareness. It's righteous consciousness gives me the peace of God. Righteous consciousness, my peace with God, gives me the peace of God. It's very, very important. Now, they go hand in hand. Anywhere you see, as I said here, uh, when righteousness is realized, peace is manifested. They go hand in hand. They're sort of like twins. When you have a righteous consciousness, the peace of God flows. It, it, it manifests in your life. When you're sin conscious, you don't have the peace of God. You're afraid of everything. You're worried about everything. You panic over everything. But when you are righteous conscious, when you realize that, it generates. Peace is manifest. So they go hand in hand. Let me show you them. In Psalm 85 and verse 10, I love this verse of scripture, and they sing songs about this, and I love the particular song they sing. Mercy and truth are met together. Talking about Jesus. The psalmist is looking down the, the, into the future and he talks about the manifestation of the Son of God and, he, and the Messiah to come and he, and he describes him as mercy and truth are met together and then righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Oh, what a, what a truth. Righteousness and peace, they, they're twins, they go hand in hand. When you become righteous and righteous conscious the peace of God manifests. When you're sin conscious, you don't have that peace. You're always worried, always concerned, always fearful. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other in Jesus. That's where they met. That's where we, that's where we experience them, in Jesus. They have this relationship. They've kissed each other. They, they're together. In Psalm 72, in verse 7, in his days shall the righteous flourish. Watch. In his days, talking about the Messiah to come. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Here they go together. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. Again, they go hand in hand. Righteousness and peace. Twins. Isaiah 32, verse 17. It says here, And the work, or the production, 
the work of righteousness. When you become righteous conscious, when you become aware of your right standing with God and your ability to come into his presence without any boundary or barrier between us, the work of righteousness, what it produces, the work of righteousness shall be this peace of God. And the effect, here's the effect of that righteousness, consciousness, and that peace of God. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. It's just quietness, calm, tranquility in every arena of my life. That, as I said, this is not something that's going to, that, that is circumstantial. I mean, if when I say calm and tranquility and assurance and peace, everything around me is just calm. And, no, no, not everything around me. Everything in me. Everything in me is quiet. Everything in me has an assurance. Everything in me has confidence. Everything in me has courage. Everything around me can be going buck mad. Everything around me can be going helter-skelter. But I'm not. You're not. So the work, the product of righteousness, shall be that peace, this peace of God. And the effect or the outworking of that righteousness or the that production of peace shall be quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places he didn't say that circumstances uh, or situations would be calm or peace he said my people will be and and this is very important that we understand that this is armor this is something that i wear and even though all hell breaks loose on every side. My righteous consciousness, my awareness of my relationship in God, with God, that there's no barrier or, or anything between us, that awareness produces peace and the effect of that peace is this quietness and assurance in my life in spite of and regardless of what's going on. That's how we put it on. If we're going to engage the enemy, all hell will break loose. You better have peace. But to have that peace, you better be righteous, righteous aware. In Isaiah 54, verse 13, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness thou shalt shall be established, thou shalt be far from oppression, thou shalt not fear, and from terror it shall not come near you. Again, here we go. These two run in hand in hand. Twins. And, and one is the outworking of the other. One is the, is the revelation of the other. One is the practical uh, manifestation of the other. And this is why righteous consciousness is so important because it produces peace. And so your children will be taught of the Lord and their peace will be great. And in this awareness of their right relationship with God, although at this stage it was an at-one-ment, but for you and I now, it's not something that was accredited like it was to them, but it's imparted to us. There's a difference. In the Old Testament, when they used the blood of bulls and goats, um, it was sort of put on the, righteousness was put on the credit card. I mean, they were accounted righteousness. They were able to use it. It was like a debit card, really. Because somebody still had to pay for it. But when Jesus came and died and rose again, he, he, he didn't give me the credit card, so to speak. He just gave me, he gave me the key to the bank. Um, it was different. I, I, it was imparted to me instead of imputed to me like it was in the Old Testament. So they go hand in hand. And again, lack of oppression, lack of fear, and, and, and no terror. Terror is a torment. So basically he's talking about when you walk in righteousness and are aware of this relationship and, and it produces this peace, it keeps you, uh, uh, it keeps you fearless and, and, you, and you, don't, you don't succumb to terror or worry and stuff like that. 
Isaiah 48, verse 17. He says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, which teach is thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that you should go. Watch. Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandment, then hath thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Of course, the sea has a bigger, um, uh, it, it's, it's a bigger uh, volume. Uh, and so righteousness is what we have in God, is, is, is our relationship with God, which is huge. But the, the, the outworking, the flow of it, is a river, which is peace. And, and a river is just constantly flowing. Here it comes. It's, it, it has a source, and it just keeps flowing. The source of the river is the ocean. Evaporation, cloud, mountain, precipitation, stream, river, and back into the ocean. So the 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 source of the river is 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 the sea. Righteousness is as the waves of the sea, and peace is as a river. And so righteousness feeds it. Righteousness feeds the ocean, feeds the rivers, and the rivers, as I said, evaporate, make the cloud. The cloud gives itself to the mountain in precipitation. We have a stream which turns into a river, which goes back into the sea, which keeps the cycle going. Righteousness produces a river, a constant flow of peace, which feeds into righteousness, which flows into peace, which feeds into my relationship, which. And it's just this cycle. But these two go hand in hand. Here, um, they're talking about Melchizedek. Melchizedek, back in the Old Testament, is a king, uh, the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem. And uh, he's a type of Jesus, because we know nothing of his history. Um, and he's always used as and referred to a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, but there's a, a couple of names referred to um, Melchizedek. And again, it, it unites these two uh, issues. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. This is a, a story back in the book of Genesis. To whom also Abraham give a tithe, or a tenth part of all, first being, by interpretation, speaking of Melchizedek, King of Righteousness. That was that was one of his names. Melchizedek, one of Melchizedek's names were King of Righteousness. And after that also King of Salem, which means King of Peace. And again, these two have kissed each other. These two have met each other. These two feed one another. Righteousness, the, the sea and the ocean of righteousness, which is huge and vast and, and is bottomless, so to speak, as far as the privileges and benefits we have now that we're in right relationship with God. But it feeds into this river of peace that flows in our life, flows in our life, flows in our life. And again, the, these two work off each other. Romans fourteen seventeen. Paul by the Spirit of God says, For the kingdom of God, it's not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And again, as we see, one feeds into the other. One is the product of the other. One is the outworking of the other. You know, I, I remember a time, I was just trying to think of an illustration to explain it. Um, I remember in my early teens, maybe 13, 14 years of age, um, I came out of a little disco that we had at the local Catholic church. So they had a, a, a hall for the youth and we had a, a disco at the youth and I uh, apparently danced the wrong individual at the disco and the the boyfriend and um, and his friends um, warned me in the disco that uh, they were going to deal with me outside. <laughs> so um, I um, danced on for the rest of the night, whatever, and I, uh, and I knew the threats were coming. 
and they said, you know, when this is over and you leave uh, the disco, um, we will meet you outside and we'll uh, put this idea of dancing this young lady out of your head forever. So I was looking for the opportune moment to leave, um, simply to avoid what was waiting for me. And um, it was a summer's evening, so in Ireland the, the, it's bright until about 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, so when I came out of the dark disco into the bright light, lo and behold, just across the the, the way was uh, this young lady's boyfriend and a couple of his mates. And uh, I didn't engage them, I ran. I run. I mean, I ran as fast as I could and I took off and they took off after me and I got an energy and I, I didn't know where I got it from, but I'll tell you, I, I ran as fast, I ran across streets, I ran through traffic and they chased me equally as, as fervently as I was running from them, they were running for me. My home was about um, a mile away. And uh, I, 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 I was heading for home. And so um, I, I'm flat out running and they are about 50, 60 feet behind me, uh, keeping with me at that pace. And um, in fear, I ran and, and it was obvious I was, I was in fear and I was running. And it was obvious they were, had an intent to beat the tar out of me when they got me. But as I was running, uh, I could see my home about maybe two, three hundred yards ahead. And my dad, uh, my father, he was out, uh, what he was doing actually, he was digging the front yard. He was going to reseed the, the grass in the front yard. It had been wore out with all the kids that, that played in it. So my dad was redigging it to reseed it. And um, I could see him in the distance. And he was out there digging and turning the sod and, and, and preparing the, the front yard for, for grass. And we had a, a pail and a fence in front. And I'm running, I mean, I'm exhausted, but I am running for fear of what's gonna happen. And as I got closer to my dad, he didn't see me, he was, he was busy working, and they were catching, they were gaining on me. But as I, as I ran towards my dad, I, I came along the, the fence, which was maybe four foot high, and I put one hand on the fence and I jumped into the, into the property. And as soon as I landed in the property, a boldness came upon me, a confidence, an assurance, an awareness that my dad was there. And as I jumped over in the, the, the paling or the, the fence into the, 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 the turn sod, my dad lifted his head up and said, hey son, what you doing? Get out of there, because I was in the middle of it. And uh, he was totally unaware of what was happening. And, and as I walked towards my dad through the sod, there was a head up, shoulders back, confidence, hey dad. And these guys eventually came up by the, the fence and my dad turned to the three guys and said, hey guys, What's happening? And they said, oh, 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 nothing, Mr. Boyle, nothing. Everything's fine. And I stood there with this grin and this smile on my face thinking, <laughs> you can't touch me. You can't touch me and you won't touch me because my dad's here. And, and I took on an arrogance um, and confidence and a smartness as I stood there with my dad. And basically I was sort of saying to them, can't touch me now. You didn't get me. I got away. Um, your plans were uh, uh, f pointless. You, you failed at your intent. And, and I stood there with that confidence because I was in the presence of my father. I was, I was confident and I was assured and I was unafraid and I wasn't intimidated because of my my relational connect with my dad just standing there and he sort of looked and he says you want anything lads and uh, they said no oh, Mr Boyle no we don't want anything and uh, 
my dad sort of looked at me as if to say, are you going with them or whatever? And I just casually walked into the house. Let me tell you, my heart stopped beating. I, I, I was no longer afraid. Once I jumped the fence and I landed in the presence of Medea. That's what this is. This awareness of this walk with God, this confidence you have in your relationship with God, causes you, you know, to always be aware that you are in His presence. You have access to His presence at all times. And you don't need to be afraid and you don't need to be worried and you don't need to be tormented and you don't need to, to, to back off or back down. It's a head up, shoulders back, chest out. I'm in right relationship with God and I have peace. And it's not peace based upon what's going on outside. It's peace based and it comes from the inside. It's not peace because my circumstances are all in, in order. It's peace because I'm in order, because I'm aware of what I have and who I am. Peace is an internal calmness, tranquility, security, safety, and a lack of fear. When I jumped the fence, I experienced this. It wasn't a peace that came just or based upon my external circumstances because seconds, moments before it was it was terrible. But once I stepped in, it was it was it came from within. It's an internal calmness, a tranquility, a security, a safety, and a lack of fear. And this is what comes when you're aware of your relationship in God, this peace of God. Let me read that once more. Peace is an internal, not external. It's not generated externally. It's generated internally. Peace is an internal calmness, tranquility, security, safety, and a lack of being afraid. Psalm, or sorry, Philippians 4, 6, Paul says this. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. The peace of God comes because I have peace with God. The peace of God comes because I have righteousness. And when I make my requests known to God, when I let God know, I said, be careful, don't be worrying, don't be anxious about anything. He says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. So it's not based on what you see out there. It passes all of that. Shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. This is an internal force that rises up within. This calm, tranquil, secure, safe place. This lack of fear. It's generated from within. This is the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.13 It says, But now is Christ Jesus Sorry, but now in Christ Jesus you who sometimes were afar off, speaking of me and you, are made nigh unto, uh, by the blood of Christ for he, Jesus Christ, is our peace. That's what I said. We're putting him on. We're stepping into him. And he is our peace. That's where our righteousness comes from. And that's where our peace comes from too. He is our peace. Who has made both one, broken down the division or the middle wall of partition between us. Jesus is our peace. This peace of God. This peace that we have in Christ Jesus. It says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah as he prophesies into the future about the birth of the Messiah, the coming Savior, Jesus, it says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This tranquil, secure, safe, fearless place is found in Jesus. As is my righteousness, because he's made unto me that too. 
and, and this comes internally in 1st Thessalonians 5 23 and the very God of peace sanctify you holy I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ you see when we live in the world here we talk about peace and peace normally you talk about the peace process like we had peace process in Northern Ireland between uh, the Catholics and Protestants we have all sorts of peace treaties and those peace treaties are all external things based upon two sides keeping an agreement and, if, and, and you're always watching to see if they break the agreement and um, so it's only as strong as and it's only as lasting as their ability to keep it the thing about the peace of God is that it's not based upon anything that I do it's based upon everything that Jesus has done for me and in Christ uh, I'm righteous and in Christ the, the, with that righteous awareness is, is, a, is a flow a, a river of peace that flows from within and it's not based on external circumstances and it's not based on what other people do it's based on what Jesus done and my faith in what Jesus done and so it's a spiritual force so you know in, in the world we use the word peace but it, it's a completely different thing it's a completely different thing it's it's calm or or a um, lack of opposition or a uh, you know lack of, of grievance or whatever between two parties but that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about an inner force that, that flows rises up within when you understand who and what you are in in Christ and your relationship with your Heavenly Father that's never going to change and, and and I can't break it and you can't break it you either have confidence in it though or you don't you're either righteous conscious and have this peace of God knowing who you are and what you are in Christ or, or you're sin conscious even as a Christian and you just don't have that peace you're worrying and, and, and fretting about everything that you see in life you know when this whole COVID thing happened I was amazed really at how fearful the church is really I mean I understand it's not a nice thing and, and, and it's dangerous and I'm not saying we shouldn't take precautions and God give us common sense and he, he give us that ability between our two ears to to do right things and we get counsel and we get guidance from those in authority over us and hey by all means obey the authority and take guidance and and be smart be intelligent Having said that, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, I know God. Don't be afraid. I have a healer. Don't be afraid. If God be for me, what can be against me? Don't be afraid. Uh, Jesus bore my sickness and carried my disease, and with his stripes I'm healed. Or do we not believe that? I mean, if you don't believe that, and you don't understand that you have that in righteousness, then be afraid. Be afraid. We don't need to be. And, and and this peace that, that, that I felt the church should have displayed or showed, um, I, I don't th think we've done a good job. I, I think there was mass panic, even, even in the church. Uh, and then a lot of people looking for words of affirmation and words of, of consolation and words of, of uh, encouragement. And, and the internet was full of... of, of Believers trying to tell believers not to be afraid. And uh, I think it revealed us. I think it exposed us um, to a degree. I think we could have done a better job. I think we'll do a much better job the next time. I think we're learning from it, and we should. But this, this is this peace of God that, that I'm talking about. And it comes from a, a righteousness consciousness. And, and I think the reason we saw a lot of fear was because of of, of not understanding who we are and what we have in Christ in Galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the Spirit see this is a spiritual force it's not a it's not a, a natural force it's a spiritual force it's the peace of God it's Jesus it's the peace of, of, of Christ that that it, he is that peace it's not an external peace it's an internal force 
The fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Peace is a spiritual force. So stop looking at circumstances to give you peace. Stop looking at or having to have all your ducks in a row before you have confidence. My confidence is I have right relationship with God. My confidence is that I don't need to be afraid, ever. Peace is not something you obtain circumstantially. It's something you possess internally. It's not, it's not a circumstantial peace. It's an internal force. It's, it's part of, of, of the fruit of your newborn spirit. It's a production of righteousness. And when righteousness is working, it produces this river, this flow of assurance and security and tranquility and calm and lack of fear. It's a, it's a peace that is not something we, you obtain circumstantially. It's something you possess internally. Psalm 56.2 And David is talking about his enemies and he was encompassed about by so many at this particular time when he wrote this. It says, They that lie in wait for me would swallow me up or trample me all day long. For there are many who fight against me, O Most High. What time or whenever I am afraid, I will have confidence in you and put my trust and my reliance in you. By the help of God, I will praise his word. On God I lean, rely, and confidently put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man who is flesh do to me? I mean, he's basically saying, God, I, I, I have a relationship with you. God, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous because of atonement, and I'll have all these enemies around me. My goodness, why would I be afraid of them? Why would I be afraid of anything if God is with me? I mean, we quote all this all the time, but when, we, when we're surrounded by circumstance, it's amazing how we crumble and fall because we're not aware of. And if we're going to engage that other arena, you've got to have this confidence, this assurance. And he says, God, I, I'm... I'm I'm going to be conf I'm confidently put my trust in you and I will not fear. Isaiah 41 10. Fear not there. Fear, fear not. There is nothing to fear. For I'm with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed. For I'm your God. I will strengthen and harden you in or to the difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my virtuous right hand of righteousness and justice. He's God saying to guys, don't be afraid. 138 times in the scripture, God tells his people, do not be afraid. Why? Because circumstances makes people afraid all the time. And this peace of God comes from a relationship with God. And it's an internal force that rises up. And in spite of and regardless of what's going on around you, you have this tranquil awareness and assurance and confidence and lack of fear. Fear not. There is nothing to fear. I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to the difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my virtuous right hand of righteousness and justice. I'll take care of you. Don't be afraid. Deuteronomy, Moses is speaking here to, to the children of Israel, and in particular into Joshua. There's so many of these, I can't put them all down, so you can, you can do your own homework on it. But he says, be strong, courageous, and firm. Fear not, nor be in terror before them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He won't fail you, and he won't forsake you. This, this is peace. 
It's not external observation, it's an internal awareness. This is what courage is. Courage is not where everything is right, it's stepping into that. It's having the boldness to, to, to do it afraid. There's a difference between fear and afraid. Uh, afraid means you're looking at the circumstances and, and, and there's an element of natural pressure. But courage is the ability to step into that circumstance with this awareness, even though there's, there's, there's an atmosphere of, of being afraid. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dread? The Lord is the refuge and stronghold of my life. Then he asks the question, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fail. And though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war will rise against me, even then, in this, will I be confident. <laughs> this, is, this is the peace that we're talking about in the hour of God. This peace. God did not give us a spirit of fear, or a spirit of timidity, or cowardice. God didn't give us that or craving and cringing and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a fond fear. But he hath given us a spirit of power, of love, of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. Let me read that again. God didn't give us a spirit of timidity He didn't give us that. He didn't give us a spirit of timidity. He, he didn't give us a, 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 a craving and a cringing and, and a fawning fear. He didn't give us that. Ugh. Oh, what am I going to do? It looks bad. <laughs> he, he didn't, that's not God. That's us. He didn't give us that. But he has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of calm, and a well-balanced mind, and discipline, and self-control. Hey, all hell breaks loose. It'll be fine. It'll change. It's a season. It'll turn. It's not over till it's over. And it's not over yet. I'll, I'll determine. It's, it's going to work out exactly as God intended for me. I will triumph in this. I will reign in life by one Christ Jesus. I will overcome. He has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of calm, and of a well-balanced mind, and discipline, and self-control. All right. I think I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah, I'm done the hour. Um. I hope, I know I've repeated myself possibly a thousand times here today, but it's really, really important. Um, you, you know, you lay truth down line upon line and precept upon precept and then here a little, there a little. You're not going to get it all in once. You're not going to grasp it all in, in, uh, in, in the one sitting. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to, um, get all the health you want in one meal or one one milkshake. It, it's a it, it's it's a process of life, uh, of of continuance. So let me let me end here, and I I, I hope that you heard what I was talking about. Uh, the the peace with God gives us the peace of God. Righteousness consciousness gives us this internal force. And we're going to be talking, I'll, I'll wind this up and I'll get into the next one as well next week. But we'll, um, we, we're going to put on these um, shoes and we're going to shod our feet with this gospel of peace. This good news of this peace, not peace with God, but the peace 
of God. And um, I'll be in the Faith Centre next Saturday morning, this time next week, and I'll be there to answer the questions that come up um, as we discuss and talk about this particular subject. Again, um, uh, let me remind you that uh, as of next week, we're back to the Faith Centre, and let me invite you to come join us there, here in Alpharetta in Georgia. And uh, I would love to hear from you. I would love you to, um, if you haven't met with us yet, please consider coming and joining us uh, next week and the weeks to come. Uh, let me pray for you. And um, again, I really do hope I get to see you all uh, in the coming week. Praise God. Father, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these principles. I thank you for the armor of God. I thank you, Lord, that you have by uh, Jesus Christ provided for us all the tools, all the resources that are necessary to not just be affected by the gospel in our own personal life, but to take the new creature that I am now in Christ and my, my new positioning that I have and, and privilege that I have and take the force of that, the power of that, and enforce change in the world that I live in by engaging the principalities and the powers that influence human affairs. I pray God as we think about and meditate on these things that you'll open our understanding to them, that you'll help us to purposefully and intentionally put on the whole armor of God. And as we do sequentially, as we grow and make that decision that my life is going to be the outworking of the revelation that Jesus Christ is alive, even though people haven't seen him, they'll see him in me. Then I will walk with a whole new understanding and, and awareness of my relationship with God and, and not just my peace with God, but this peace that flows now because of that, this peace of God. And I'll walk with a confidence and a fearlessness and a boldness as I engage and encounter the, the enemy, as I enforce their defeat and bring to bear influence in the world I live in. Uh, help me to grasp this in Jesus' name.